So this is Family Framework in Christian Education, and uh, my name is Sarah Britton, and I'm really glad y'all are here. So um, I'm excited about the next, this time we have together. Hopefully um, I can give a couple things that you guys can take back to your ministry locations, and um, selfishly I also hope I can steal some things and take those back with me as well. Um, but as we start this session, uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time for us to come together and to collaborate. Uh, we thank you so much that we get to share Jesus with children and, and families. And we just ask you to, um, to bless us in that. Uh, be with us in this time and as we learn more um, about how to serve you. In your name we pray. Amen. So a little bit about me, um, this, uh, um, I'm, I am, uh, so I'm a church worker kid, my dad was a pastor, um, part of that too is why I have gone to 12 churches in my life, um, five of them I worked at, but the other um, seven are my dad's fault, um, <laughs> but um, my husband, Chris, and I have been married for 15 years. Uh, we do not have children, so I don't have any of the cute children pictures that people like to put up. But um, I normally, uh, we, we're a Basset Hound family, but we're between Bassets right now. So I had to stick a little Basset Hound in the corner just so I'm, I'm projecting to get a Basset Hound in 2023. Um, we love to backpack and hike. That's me um, before I went down into the Grand Canyon and made it back without having to be rescued. I'm still very proud of that. <laughs> um, down here on the bottom corner, is me and my best friend Carrie. Um, she's a Lutheran school teacher at Lutheran South in Houston, Texas. Um, and uh, she's my BFF. We put it on forms. Uh, I'm her emergency contact as her BFF, so it's a legal term. Um, and then the group at the top is um, at my previous call, we started a young adult ministry. And when I left, to the church 30 minutes away. Um, we continued that relationship, and a month ago we got to go to the Magic Castle in, um, in L.A., and so that's us dressed up way more than we're normally <laughs> dressed up. But a little bit about my story of how I got to where I am. Um, so I started out ministry um, doing college ministry in Stillwater, Oklahoma, at Oklahoma State. Go Pokes! Um, I love the orange of this conference because it's just in my happy place with all the bright orange. Um, my, next, I was at um, Chapel of the Cross in St. Louis um, doing youth, young adults, and outreach. Um, I am DCE trained. I went to Seward. I guess I should throw that in there, too. Uh, <laughs> and then my husband drug me to Texas. Uh, so he lived in T Dallas. I lived in St. Louis. And when we got married, we thought, eh, we might live in the same state. So um, I, <laughs> I, he moved me to, uh, we moved to Austin, Texas. We're there for 10 years. And then uh, five years ago, he got promoted, and we moved to Cal Southern California. Um, I was blessed to work at a church uh, that had a preschool and a day school. Welcome. Come on in. Um, and I worked there for a little bit. Uh, stuff happened, as we all know, but uh, that happens in church work. And uh, I had an opportunity. Um, so I'd done youth ministry, children's ministry, youth ministry, family ministry, DCE, traditional kind of thing. Um, and when stuff got a little wonky, um, I was lamenting to a DCE friend that worked at the church down the street that was having some other stuff. And I was like, well, maybe I should be your preschool director. I should apply to be your preschool director. That one sentence changed my life. <laughs> and in four months, I was back in school. Um, I actually had my interview for the call here at this conference <laughs> four years ago. Um, and went back to school to get my, uh, the classes I needed for California to be um, a preschool director and um, then was extended a call um, to be the Director of Missions and Ministry at Christ the King in Newberry Park. Um, part of that story also includes um, kind of the, the story of, of Christ the King. Um, our church isn't that pretty, but our view is amazing. So <laughs> whenever we put out pictures of our church, we just do pictures of our view because it's so beautiful. <laughs> I'm going to listen to this recording and I'm going to get in trouble. But uh, <laughs> so 
So the previous pastor at Christ the King um, had this vision of the preschool at Christ the King had been kind of its own little thing off in the corner. They did that. They really didn't have any Christian curriculum. They weren't really connected to the church for probably the last eight to ten years. And um, he wanted to change that. And so um, went to the district and said, hey, do you have anybody that can do like this and that? And they're like, yeah, that person doesn't exist. Um, and then two years later, I was like, hey, well, I might be interested in doing something along those lines. Um, and, uh, but the vision was, how do we connect the church and the school, which we talk a lot about at these conferences. I'm not talking about anything that is like earth shattering or nobody's ever heard before. Um, but really wanted to be intentional about that. And in the process of that, um, I took over the preschool. The previous director had resigned and told everybody that the school was closing. Yay. Um, so we had 14 st students in our school. Um, which was really great because I got to learn how to be a preschool director when there wasn't a lot of kids. Um, and then, uh, right, we were building up. We were about 30 students in our school, and then COVID hit. Um, and so we closed for six weeks, and when we reopened, we had six students. Um, and so, again, had to relearn how to do things, as we all, as we all did. I'm not, again, nothing new to this, but... Um, Part of that whole process was um, when I was taking my courses, um, one of the classes, one sentence in one paragraph in my intro to curriculum class that I had taken, because they didn't take my curriculum classes I had taken at um, Seward, they didn't count, but um, there was one sentence that said, there's this kind of new movement in childcare of being, looking at the whole family as you're doing the curriculum. And this family focused, and I was like, that's it. That's what we're doing. We're partnering with families. We're going to be family focused. We're going to connect with families. And away we went. And as we grow and shrunk and then grew again, um, we have gone along this journey of what does it mean to partner with families? Now, as a good DCE, I would start with scripture, right? So what does scripture say about, oh, sorry, missed one. So what is the family framework? This is our, our really fancy couple sentences. The whole family partners in the educational experience. The church and school engages and equips families by providing a framework of developmentally appropriate curriculum, focusing on spiritual, social, emotional, language, intellectual, and physical learning. So um, what does that mean? <laughs> it's a couple sentences. Now, my preschool people are like, oh, yeah, that's developmentally appropriate. You got your social, emotional. I see the nodding. And then I see a couple going, like, what? Um, we really like developmentally appropriate in preschool. <laughs> we were like, don't give us a bunch of third grade curriculum and tell us to put it in a pre-K classroom. We want stuff that is meeting the needs of the children in our school. Um, but so with that, as we're building this idea, we start with scripture. Um, so what biblical stories pop to your mind when you first think how, about partnering or families from the Bible? Anybody? Both. I like, I love examples. Well, there's a lot of bad examples. I mean, even in the bad examples, there's some good, but we see, I mean, as every family, no family is perfect. It's just as every church is full of sinners, every family is full of sinners. Um, Jacob and Esau. Joseph, yeah, Joseph and his brothers. What? Abraham and Isaac. Yeah. That's a good example. I like the Timothy. There you go. Yeah. Jesus was in a family. Exactly. And here's the crazy part. All of those examples, every single one of those families was different. You had big families. You had small families. Yes. Moses and Aaron. Moses and Aaron. <laughs> yeah. So, Lois and Eunice is one that I think of too. Uh, now, actually, weirdly, that picture in the first has a Lois, and her mom's name is Eunice. So um, it's backwards, but uh, they're they're my Lois and Eunice. So um, I also think of sometimes we. What about partnerships? Moses and Aaron's a great partnership as well. When you think of partnering together, 
Who do you think of from the Bible? Adam and Eve? David and Jonathan? Yeah. But Elijah and Elisha, yeah. John, James and John. So we have all of these people that work together. And, you know, we can, we can look at some of them where that went really well for a while and then it didn't. Uh, and there was conflicts and there was forgiveness and, and all the things that, that we know. Well, I did pull out a couple scripture verses, too, that, you know, talk about supporting one another and partnering. Um, a lot of them, I felt like last night, I was like, well, okay, they took that Bible verse. All right, then I went that one. <laughs> so I do have a couple in here that they didn't use last night between the, the two sessions. But carry each other's burdens. We have an opportunity with our, our schools and with our ministries and our churches to, to walk alongside people in the fun stuff and in the mess. And, and when we carry each other's burdens, um, we, we care and show compassion and love for one another. Um, one of the thing, other things I love about these kind of events is like, and I, maybe this is a DCE thing, but we love to tell everybody, you know, to talk to our peers about all the things we're doing wrong and how things aren't going well. Um, and there's just something uh, uplifting about being able to be vulnerable with, uh, with others that kind of know that journey. Um, also, uh, Philippians 1, 3 through 5. Got to get a Philippians 1 in there, too. Um, I thank God every time I remember you in all my prayers. I always pray with joy because of the partnership in the gospel. From the first day until now. Um, first, Peter 4, 8 through 10, above all, love each other deeply because love cult covers a multitude of sins. Um, the Pacific Southwest District has a conference, um, a little one-day conference, where pastors and preschool directors and principals go together. Um, and President Gibson was one of the speakers, and he, was, he, was hint, he, he really pressured us on this one. Um, this last uh, conference of how pastors and preschool to get directors working together, supporting one another, being there. And the more you communicate, the more you care about each other, the more you're going to be forgiving too, and the better you will be at putting the best construction on things. Because when you have a breakdown in that relationship, it's, it's really easy to see. And I've, I've, I've had those breakdowns in relationships. Um, where you, you see the worst in people. And that, that eighth commandment, putting the best construction on everything, is hard. But when you're talking to each other, when you're communicating, when you're showing love for another, it's easier to forgive those, oh, well, he probably didn't mean it that way. It just came off a little wrong. Versus, well, he just doesn't like me, and he's trying to destroy me, or you know, whatever else random things we go through in our heads. And a good Ecclesiastes. I don't I like Ecclesiastes. Uh, two are better than one because they have a good return on their labor. If either one falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Um, also, if two lie together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Now, my husband and I like bike backpacking, so that last bit is, is really important, especially. Um, I, don't, I still don't know the new name of Indian Garden in um, the Grand Canyon, but one of the coldest nights camping of my life was at that campsite. It was called Indian Garden at the time, but um, it got down to 12 degrees. It was really cold, so... All right, so, so we talked about what the Bible says. We talked about how we see all these examples of families and partnerships. We, we see God telling us in his word that we're supposed to work together, build each other up. So, and again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm a DC. I'm not a rocket scientist. Like, this is stuff you guys know. This is stuff you're already probably doing. Um, but just a couple research. Um, so I did put, I Googled family framework just to see what came up because I kind of, put those words together in my head. And um, apparently the Department of Health and Human Services for our government also has a family framework. Now the thing I like about this is like the family well-being, like the child outcomes are the, at the end of the arrow. Now this is designed for Head Start. And as we know with Head Start, they're reaching out to um, lower income families um, so how are those partnerships? But even if I look at this from the perspective of my school, of the foundation of who we are, how we want to impact people, 
how we see the family outcomes, um, the family well-being. We all know this, when, when the family's breaking down, how much that affects the kids. Um, my, uh, one of my partners in ministry, Bonnie, went to the trauma yesterday in a uh, session where they were talking about how the brain, and it literally changes the brain. Um, so we see the impact that the family well-being, the positive parent-child relationships, and then the outcomes of having, be, being safe, being healthy and well, um, learning and developing, engaged in positive relationships, all of those things. And so it's coming from the mindset of like, let's not focus on the child first and then build the foundation. Let's build the foundation first and then the result is, is of, of how we help and support the child. Um, I'm a big family systems theory fan. <laughs> um, and just understanding how everything is interconnected. That what happens here affects the other. Um, there's, a lot of times you'll see this with the circles. Um, where family systems theory understands human behavior through a complex web of emotional processes with one's family work and social systems. The church is one of those social systems. Um, <laughs> family so society members impacts individuals' character and life choices. Um, and the, we assume that family is a complex emotional, your families are complex, you know? <laughs> My brother, why does he do, like, that's not how we were raised. We were raised to live in a certain way, and you're doing these things that are different, and, and all of that. The emotional interconnectivity and the family, community, and social relationships, they're all reciprocal. Now, this is the one I always say wrong. So I'm going to try to say it right, but I'm probably still going to say it to you. The bioecological systems theory. And the thing I like about this one is is the arrows. The, the assumptions are each system affects each other. So you have the child in the middle, yes, but you know, a lot of times, like with family systems, you'll see the, the child in the middle and then the family and then the community. And this one makes the assumption that all those other things affect the family, which then affect the child. Um, and it's interesting when you look at this, so I have a bunch of circles. My husband said it was confusing, and I shouldn't include them, but I'm doing it anyway. Um, but religious hierarchy, that's us. Local religious community, that's us. Um, I didn't circle peer group, but the church and the school can be part of that. Um, the, we're in the neighborhood. We're the school. We're the educational system. All of those, we have all these influence and impact and support areas already in place to help the developing child. And if your school is anything like my school, you also have parents, friends, and parents' workplace, because I have a couple kids in my school whose parents also work there or have worked there. Um, and all of that, how the interconnectivity, the back and forth, the push and pull. So that's how we got to the foundation of this idea of family framework. But how does that framework work in, in actual application. Um, so uh, one of the big things that our school does to help get to know, because to support and partner with families, you got to first build the relationship and to, to earn their trust. And yes, in, in, a, in our, our school settings, I mean, Doing youth ministry prior to being in school's ministry. At youth ministry, you're constantly chasing after the families, trying to say, I have something valuable. Come. You know, I, 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 can, I can help you with the education and support of your child. I can do this. I come to this thing. And then with our school's ministry, they're already valuing it because they're already they're paying the tuition. They, they value the education experience. Whether they're Christian or not, there's some reason why they picked your school. And that's a preschool or a day school or a high school, whatever. Those families are already saying they value it. So they're already, we already have a step in the door that doing other type of ministries, we got to get them in the church before we can get them connected to Sunday school or, or whatever else. But in our school ministries, we already have that relationship. So one of the things we do is every Thursday morning, we have ladies from the church 
and I have no organization or impact or contact. I do nothing to make this happen, which is a joy to me. Um, but we have ladies in the church. They organize it. They make sure they make coffee every Thursday morning. And somebody buys donuts, and they sit outside the gate, and they talk to parents. And yes, sometimes our pastor is there, and sometimes I'm there, or the other DCE is there. She's actually the DCE. I'm the other DCE. She's been there longer. Um, but it's amazing to see that family that goes, okay, here's, a, okay, a, a, they're checked in, they're ready to go by. Is now like, okay, well, I have to get to school early on Thursday, so I have enough time to drink my really cheap Folgers coffee, coffee that does not taste good. I make my own coffee inside, and then <laughs> I bring my own cup outside, um, not to, but um, we have families sometimes that are sitting out in, outside of our gate for an hour, talking not just to the church ladies, but also talking to each other, building those relationships, building those friendships, building those contact points, and I think that's where, as they have, they build their own micro communities as well. And that happens in our schools without the coffee. You know, you have those people that their kids become friends, and so then the parents become friends. Or the parents are like, well, I guess I have to be friends with this parent, even though I really don't like them. Um, but coffee has been, was the fir kind of the first step into this um, mindset. And the fact that it's our church members that do it. And they're, ret they're all older women, retired. Um, but one of the other cool stories is the last time we had the preschoolers sing in church, um, one of the coffee ladies is Miss Virginia, or Miss Ginia, because half the kids can't say Virginia, so they, she's just Miss Ginia. And um, she's seven years old, about this tall, and she's the drummer for our praise band. And so these kids come to church, and they're sitting up and singing, and Miss Virginia, Miss Ginia, sitting behind the drums. And I heard four kids after church going, Mommy, can I take drum lessons so I can be like Miss Ginia? That, that's not, that's, I mean, yes, there's, there's the viewpoint or the influence or, or whatever else. But it's those church members that are passionate about not just supporting the school. Look, the checks are nice. The, the fundraisers and when they write the check or somebody offered to buy me a new changing table last week. He's like, oh, just tell me how much it is. I'll buy it. And I'm like, okay, those, those people are great. But the people that are, have the time and ability to come and build the relationships really do um, have a major impact. Um, one of the other things that we do, um, and I didn't ask for permission, so I'll probably get in trouble from this, but um, we do a baby blanket ministry. So we have um, ladies in our church and in our community that don't go to our church that make baby blankets. And then, and the one thing we ask them is while they're making the baby blanket to pray for the child that's going to receive it. And so whenever um, a new baby is born, now we, uh, just for context, our school doesn't start till two. So we don't have infant care. Um, but whenever we have a new baby born from any of our families in our preschool, we give them a baby blanket, a baby Bible, a baby's first Bible, and a little stuffed angel and all of that. But in the card, we tell them that their child was prayed for. The child, that, and the person that made the blanket doesn't know who receives it. Um, now, I, I had a bunch of Christmas blankets, and I had no Christmas babies. And um, Lois McKinney, um, her... If anybody knows um, Dream or Carrie Hoff, um, they had their first child, and so I sent a baby blanket up to Seattle for them. But, um, and so that's a picture of, uh, and then, yeah, them with the baby blanket. But to be able to tell the parents your child was prayed for before they even came into this world, that we value not just the kids that are here, but value those relationships. I have a lot of examples where parents that are, and I'm sure you guys do too, where parents call you back. They're like got a second grader that's starting to have behavioral problems and they're not getting any feedback from the local public schools. And they're like, you're the last person that I trusted, that I knew cared enough to stop. And they'll call me and like, well, two years ago, did you see this? Like, no, but a lot could happen in two years. But, you know, here's some resources. Here's some stuff. Here's some other ways that we can support you. Even though the, the financial relationship is gone, 
and they might never ever darken the door of our church. We pray that they darken the door of some church, but that um, that relationship continues on. And we try to do everything we can to communicate that. Um, we also do a 0.5K. Um, so we had a... <laughs> it's one of my favorite events of the year. So we have a pumpkin fest, the fall festival, blah, blah, blah. It's part of that. Um, so the first year we did it, we have a student in our school that has a condition called Marfan syndrome, which is an interconnected connective tissue um, disorder. Um, and so we raised money for that family. And so we did a 0.5K. They ran around the church. It was about 0.5-ish. Uh, and um, we had rest stations with donut holes <laughs> and beer um, <laughs> and apple juice, apple juice for the kids, and then little servings of, you know, because it's, it's hard to run 0.5K. So, uh, but we lean into it. We, we also have a beer garden at our festival, different things like that. Uh, again, those community touches, those opportunities to um, engage with the families. Um, we, uh, what are you guys doing? What areas, what, what, so I did the poll. I'm going to jump back to my poll real quick, and then we'll go back to that question. Um, I did the poll. Did anybody look at the poll? Did anybody take the poll? So I, I asked the question, how well do you think your church is doing with partnering with families? Um, awesome. Anybody awesome? Good? Oh, awesome. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay? Poor? Partnering with families, what's that? All right, we're already better. We had a couple people actually answer that. Um, <laughs> but I, and I think probably um, you, you're probably doing about one step better than you think you are. If my guess is if, if you're doing okay, you're probably doing good to great. Um, because we already, I, there's just, it's in our human, it's in our nature as Christians and Lutherans and, and all of that to love one another and to serve one another and, and to, to partner with one another. People love our Lutheran schools. People know what, they might not know what they're getting when they start, but at the end of the relationship, they, they know they got something different. Um, and and the, the tools and the, the way. So how do you think your church, like, or do you guys have any examples of how your churches engages with families? So yes. Church, oh. So usually we do chapel on Wednesday mornings, but once a month, uh, in the afternoon at 4.30, we do family chapel. And that's really been the start of kind of bridging that gap a little bit just to kind of introduce it. And it gets the kids so excited. I'm a preschool teacher at high school for a few years, turning into like working with the children's ministry. And just how excited that the kids get to be a part of it. We also have like chapel holders, so they get to go up the candle and get an ensemble leader, mm -hmm. offering gym holders, and their parents get to see their child up there participating in those activities. And then we'll also do like a like a random Thursday night, like brewery night, family night, kind of to kind of get the families together. So we're we're still trying to come up with a lot more ideas, but we're just we're starting to kind of figure out some more ways to do that. But we've had a lot of success with the family chapel. That's awesome. So we have threads of faith ladies at the church. Okay. This is just one thing. Threads of faith. Threads of faith. Okay. So they're little pillows, and then each kid gets a pillow, and then they put. That's really cool. I like that. I'm gonna take that one back. Uh, <laughs> I like the family chapel too. Awesome. And one of the things that, uh, I come from Texas, so we had two schools there, but anyway, um, one of the things I do, because we're just new, so we haven't really, like, dug into it all, we've only been open since January 11th, but I try to invite my pastor to every tour. 
So like every time I book a tour, I invite him on the calendar. Because it to me, it shows the family, hey, this is not just Cora doing it. It's like Pastor Tim. And then we need to go in the classroom and meet the teacher. And you know, and that's been helping to kind of let them know it's a community. It's not just, you know, you're not just going to drop a child off. So, yeah, you're part of something bigger. Yes, absolutely. Inviting pastor, I'm also repeating this for the recording, but inviting pastor to tours so he can be part of the conversation. Uh, in the back. We have prayer partners. Our church actually experienced the church partners every time we show up and students in the school, and they are prayer partners for the school here. We do a Christian Education Sunday in September where we so prayer partners where there's somebody from the church that's actively praying for a student in the school prays for the I love that that it's two way that it's not just the church praying for the school but the school family prays for the church family as well yeah Families to meet up with their That's great. You had one? Uh, well, I also stand out front with uh, coffee and tissues on the first day of school, but uh, I. <laughs> oh, I like the tissues. Uh, I try to uh, intentionally go on as many field trips as possible and um, get. Uh, I, I have a like, mentor system. I just took a call. But uh, I have a mentor system in children's ministry. And so on those field trips, I can not only be that presence amongst mm -hmm. the That's really, how do you make the, and I think that the, like the engaging, the making the connections we're pretty good at. Um, now the second question with equipping, what kind of, and this, I should actually put this in my, my areas we're growing, uh, our growth areas. We, we're pretty good at the engaging, we're starting to work on the equipping. Um, COVID made that really difficult um, when, you know, nobody wanted to have um, those kind of group kind of sessions or, you know, how do we equip parents? What tools can we give them to be better in the roles? And I, I mentioned family and we've leaned really heavy on parents, but we also look on how do we make those contact points and engage with the siblings as well, or grandma that might live in the house, or whatever the family system looks like, we're trying to make those contact points, not just the child in our school that's there from two to five, but how do we to make those contact points. But equipping is probably one of our growth areas where we're working on right now. That it's the DCE, the principal of the school, and I just talking over different things that are going on because we like my heart is like these parents need some tools and like they don't have time to come in on a Friday night for two hours or a Wednesday yep. night for two hours, but they do have time like while they're working out to listen to a podcast and just kind of talking and bringing things together. So that's one thing that we've kind of That's a great idea. A podcast. And even if it's not like if you don't have the time or resources, there's a lot of those podcasts are out there to share and go, hey, I was listening to this podcast or um, my teachers do that a lot. And that's the other part of the coin is that, yes, me as the, the preschool director and the director of missions and ministry for the church, like there's things I can do, but my teachers and what they do is just, is probably more important than anything I do. Um, of having them understand the paradigm of where we partner with families, we partner with families, um, and, and how that, that connects. But a lot of times my teachers will suggest podcasts to parents as well. I was just gonna back that up. I was even gonna say, is, is most of the teachers we're hiring are not Lutheran. Yeah. So they don't know who we, what we're about. And so um, one of the things that Pastor Tim does is at orientation, he talks about the roots of Lutheran. Like, who are they? Like, what yeah. is even important? They don't have to be Lutheran. You know, they need to understand it. And it seems like that was really helpful. Because <laughs> she was with me since we opened. Just to, for her to understand, like, the she, she didn't know what it was. So. 
Uh, yeah, and, and those kind of tools um, were actually, because we noticed that was a weakness in our staff, so we have our big in-service day on Monday, um, and we're starting, we're walking the whole staff through the uh, Making Jesus Real curriculum that the Pacific Southwest District put together. Um, and there's discussion guides and, and all of that. Now, my pastor is involved in doing some of that, so of course he's going to pull out the parts he wants to use and talk about the stuff he wants to talk about. But um, it's, it's not a bad curriculum because, you know, it's, it's got a video that's about 15 minutes and then you kind of um, discussion questions that they can go through for there. And it's a four session with an introduction. So we're doing the first session at our in-service on Monday. So I'll let you know next week how it goes. Uh, <laughs> but um, then our monthly staff meetings we're going through one of the sessions through that and just taking, being intentional about making sure that you're teaching at a, a Christian school. And yeah, all my teachers are Christian um, and attend worship, but um, none of them, I'm the only one that goes to the church. So um, trying to, to bridge that gap um, and the value of, you know, the Jesus circle time and the value of making sure that you have um, that, that we talk about Jesus in our classrooms. And it's not just once a week at chapel for five minutes that there's something about God, that it's all the time. Um, we're blessed that we're a small preschool and we have three staff in all three of us go to the church. Nice. Amazing. Um, uh, but Bless one you. of the things that we do to, to connect with some families is we have um, a few families in our church that have um, are on the spectrum with mm -hmm. their children. So we offer um, a Lego building day. Ooh, I like that. Lego building day? We do it so that we break it up into two, two areas. One area is quiet building area, and one is for kids who just would like to go <coughs> and jump them around and do all kinds of stuff. So, And we are different levels and vertical parts so that they're not bothering each other. It's very interesting to see how they're Go from one to the other and see how what the things are. I like that Lego building day. That's that's um, yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, real quick in the back, and then you're after. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I think I'm in a position where I do with children in the ministry and trying to come to the Right. So it's really like. Our teachers aren't all members, but some of them are. They've been very intentional, and we've had a discussion of them coming to church things, and there's just as much connection with families there. But I've got some families that have some financial difficulties and things like that. So having that break between when the, the church can offer, and they're connected with resources in the community and things like that, that maybe are typically given out to you know public schools and things like that, has been a really great resource because I'll have teachers come to me and say, I. This parent has struggled to make rent or have enough food. What can we do? And I'll, the pastor will come in and he's either a resource for counseling, but also a chance to be like, hey, we have these gift cards, we have these things, let's get you connected. And that builds up for Well, and I think that that's the, the blessing. So my previous call, I, I did more of that role where I, I was the, the DCE that then partnered with the schools. Um, now I'm the preschool director that partners with the church. So, um, but those contact points and knowing the kind of being able to have, um, knowing where the resources are available and how to support families um, in when, when those trials happen. Yes. Our church has a community garden and in the summer once a week the kids come up and, and garden with us. And frequently the parents will come up and see what's going on in the garden and give me a chance to nurture some relationships mm -hmm. with these parents. And a couple of times I'm able to get the dads to help me out on some heavy things I needed to move around. And, and uh, it's been an uh, opening to get to know the family's presence. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that, um, one of the resources that um, I really like is this book, The Power of Moments. Um, has anybody read it? Is anybody familiar with it? Um, uh, Chip and Dan Heath, The Power of Moments. It's a lot of stories, so it's a really quick read. It's like 250 pages, but I, like, I read it. I'm a reader, so my timing of reading, but I, I think I finished it in like 
two days um, in my non-working time. But uh, the, the great part about that book is it talks about, again, of course, the power of moments and those contacts, those touches, those ways to amplify um, the, the connections. And I think, too, with some of these, like the events that we have, the community gardens, the different, the chapels, the different things that we do, we, we provide some of those opportunities to um, elevate the moments so that their, their memory, they stay in our memories. We remember going to, you know, parents remember their preschoolers, Christmas program, they, those are those, the power of those moments and then how do you, and I think um, as I'm reading that, I'm thinking of, they, they talk about the power of the positive moments, but also the hard moments of the, the text message when you know a friend's uh, child is in the hospital, of that, that, that contact point of being able to to provide love and support and, and, and those connections. Um, I was really convicted by it because like I showed you our baby blanket ministry, like so cool, we love to celebrate. We're really good in the church of celebrating the happy stuff. And in the moment of the funeral, with like the, the, the food, we're really good at the food at a funeral. Like um, we're really, really good. My brother calls it the dead spread. Um, <laughs> Pastor's kids, again, pastor's kids. Um, but I was really convicted reading this book that we don't have a process in place for the tough times. So, you know, I had a, a parent come into my office and was, I was like, oh, she's just walking by my office. I'm like, oh, how are you doing, Leslie? And she's like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm still not doing very good. And I was like, what's going on? She's like, well, you heard my, my mom passed away at Christmas. And I was like, no, nope. no, I did not hear that. I am so sorry, blah, blah, blah. Like she had told the teacher, but then we've, we got to figure out a process. So that not a checklist, but a process of how to, when those kind of information happens, make sure that the right people are aware and that it's not in a gossipy way, but it's in a, to support the family. Um, I ended up talking to the woman for a little bit and I just, and then like that next week, I'm reading this book going, man, if we had something in place where, you know, we have Stephen Ministry at our church. We have, like, all the Lutheran Hour, like, little, or the little books and, and the different, we have all those resources, but in the moment, I'm just like, how do I love on this mom? And that's some of the things of, like, how do you have that, that, that process in place so that when that rough thing happens, you're not starting behind the eight ball. You've got, you've got a couple steps in place, a couple thought processes, car accident happens, something that, that hard kid in the hospital, some of those things where we have, you kind of go, okay, we're, who's going to be the contact person? Who's going to touch when? How are we going to do that? How are we going to love this family through it? Uh, I've seen so many hands. I don't know where to start. Over here. And our pastor over the last several years has made a very intentional effort that he offices out of the school two to three days a week. And he's there every day because he teaches religion and he's in staff devotions every morning. And it's awesome. But over, especially the last two years, because he's been so much more present on school campus and greeting out front and everything, non Church families, families without church background have come to him for pastoral counseling. We've had students that we've been able to refer to him that are going through stuff because he knows them, they know him, you know, to be that check-in. But, um, you know, he just tries to get to know every family, you know, with that contact. We, in all of our Friday, in every week's Friday night, it's a standing, uh, you know, we'd love to have you in worship. The pastor's here for you and your family. Any you need it, here's his email. You know, reach out with anything. Our teachers have been told if you hear anything in your family, just, you know, text the pastor so he can be aware and then he can kind of do some of that reach out and stuff too. But it's been amazing to just see that change of him not being, you know, really present on campus and not having that connection. And now he's doing almost as much counseling of school families as what he's doing. 
Well, and I, yeah, you go. Yes. calling the kids my name, and from just the beginning of the school year to even now, midway through the year, it's amazing how much those relationships deepen and develop, and people just feel comfortable, they know you, and you know their name, and it's just like a doorway to conversation, and so many times parents on their way up to staff have talked with us for a long time, and it's just awesome, it's just like standing at the door for five minutes. Yeah, and, and the power of those those moments, and, and I think, too, learning the parents' names, Really working with encouraging my teachers to learn, like that's part of partnering with the families. You need to know mom and dad's name. You need to know grandma. If grandma drops off and picks up, you need to know their name because it matters just as much to the parent. You know, the three-year-old, they're like, you know my name. Seriously, 40-year-old woman, you know my name. Being called by your name is such a huge contact point. So... If I was to give advice or encouragement in that area, I would say encourage your, st your teachers and your staff to, n to not just learn the kids' names, but to learn the parents' names, too. Yes. Yeah, they on. <laughs> hey, but whatever works, whatever works. So, yes, in the back. So you talked a little bit about the process of the, you know, the allow facilitation, and then there's equipping too, and you know, you continue on that uh, progress of uh, continually giving uh, more mm, tools to parents in that in their parenting role. I think another area for um, development is also in, I'll call it uh, maybe topical. So we have education, right? We've also got fellowship. But other areas can be um, service, like mm -hmm. serving together as family. Um, you know, you can paint a whatever uh, a wall outside or inside. The three-year-old can do it. It's not going to look pretty. But like, you know, um, All of our planter boxes at the school are adorable, and right. they, but they're not pretty, but they're adorable. Um, but, you know, and then you've got worship, too. Yeah. You know, to have the family participate in the worship service, and, you know, that might mean that you have to uh, reconfigure some traditions that you're used to doing as a church, but if you can uh, find ways to sit around the family and have the family do those sorts of things together. Like, this is one of those things where we'll just we'll just see how it goes, right? The air gross of gross areas, like communicating with my pastors, of the it would be really great if we could get you and your wives and your kids to come up and do communion with you. Because otherwise they my just do by my themselves, dad. right? <laughs> And it's kind of one of those where it's it's hard to it's hard for me to make a case to them as to why this is important for them as a family unit to do together because then the questions arise like well logistically how in the world we do that or my wife isn't comfortable being singled out to go up to the front like that or you know different different things along along those lines but. Um, being able to find ways to, to bring the family together in those four realms. For me, those are the mm -hmm. different things I like to focus on. And mm -hmm. the, well, this is to go quite as well as I Pilots are great. Like, my husband's in corporate America, and they do pilot programs all the time. Do a pilot. Try something. Like, hey, let's, we're going to try for two months. We're going to try this and see how it works. And then we'll come back and reevaluate it. I think sometimes as a church we go, we're going to start this ministry and we're going to invest all this time and all this money and all these resources and then nobody shows up. And we're like, 
well, don't people value it, but like do a little thing and then let it grow and then come back and do checks and balances. I was at a session yesterday where they were talking about evening activities and nobody comes to that, but if they do it during the after school time, their, their numbers are, are great and the child engagement and the family engagement even is, is so much higher than doing a Wednesday night program. And like, those are the things of like, you know, do pilot programs, do try something for a, a short period of time and then see how it goes. And if it works, then invest more time and money into it. But you know, it's, it's hard for us because we don't want to look, we want to look at like the spiritual side of things, but we're also in the, the ROI business. Like what is the return on investment? How are like, we're investing this in and we'll never get a financial ROI back. I mean, some of our schools might break even and, you know, whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the emotional return on investment, the spiritual, the, the being able to see. We have two Jewish families in our school, um, one of which, when they chose our school, grandparents said, I'm not paying for tuition anymore because they left a, a, a Jewish school to come to our school. I still haven't figured out why they did that, but I, we're very glad that they're at our school. Um, but one of the families keeps asking me, well, what's your worship times? What's worship like? We're thinking about coming to church. And I'm like, they're a Jewish family that's thinking about coming to church. And I'm like, I have to like hold my happy dance in like internal. And then I like go in my office and I'm like, yay, um, praise Jesus. Um, but uh, they still haven't come, so I, I still have a little bit of disappointment, but they, they've asked, like, what do you wear to church? Uh, what, you know, if my wife comes in leggings, is she going to get in trouble? I'm like, no, uh, <laughs> because half the ladies in my church are wearing leggings. So, like, be comfortable, you know, yes? How do you train your church to be ready for those people coming in? So it does help. So uh, most of my life, I lived in middle America, St. Louis. Kansas, Nebraska. I'm in Arkansas. Yes. Okay. Oklahoma. Yeah. So I understand that culture. I'm in a culture that's different than that. So um, while if they showed up for our 8:30 service, there might be some side eye kind of things. Um, I don't think it would happen in our praise service. Uh, I could be wrong. I don't know. Um, but. Actually, our second service gets in trouble. Sometimes people are like, everybody talked to me. I felt like I was on, on display. I felt you know, people come, like, we're too nice sometimes. We're like, there's a new person here. Yes. And we're like, yes. And, and then they're like, um, we're, we're, we're good. Um, and then we've got a, a gentleman in our church that after service gives out juice and um, little um, cracker, uh, animal crackers. And so visiting families are like, who is this old guy giving my kid candy and juice? And I'm like, he's safe, I promise. He's the former president of the congregation. He just loves kids. So Something that has helped is, is, is the, you have to back it up a bit. Those people who are greeting and handing out, they, the kids already know them. So like the church treasurer is Papa Ed. He comes in, you know, twice a week to do checks and do all of that stuff. And all the kids know him. My kids call him Papa Ed. He's not my grandpa. And so now all the kids call him Papa Ed. So when the kids can see him out in town or something, they're like, Mom, it's Papa Ed! You know, and there's three or four volunteers like that. So when they have finally visited our church, it's not as creepy because they've like already like seen them like at a birthday party or... Well, and I think the, the culture of communication is huge too. Um, I, uh, and I'll use it for the church first and then I'll, I'll use it for the school, but, um, communicating what's happening. Um, I, in my ministry journey, I've had a couple times where finances got tough and the DCE is usually the first one on the chopping list. Um, cause we can't get rid of the third pastor, but we can get rid of the, never, sorry, sorry, God. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize for that. Um, but uh, the after I walked through that, I started doing my own announcements in church, and it completely changed my ministry. And now in my current setting, that's not the culture of the church I'm in. But in the church I was in, I did my own announcements, and it was huge, the impact. All of a sudden, because they saw from me talking about 
hey, we're, you know, we need two more coaches for our uh, children's ministry program. All you have to do is walk kids from this room to this room and make sure they don't wrestle during Sunday school. You don't have to, we have teachers, we just need a coach. And like people going, well, wait, what are they doing in Sunday school? I'm like, go check, you know, and then they're like, well, why do you, why does this, why are they moving? I'm like, go check out Sunday school. But it opened the conversation because people saw me up front. Um, so I, th I see the value of however you can communicate what's happening in the school. And also remember that written communication is not the only kind of communication. So just because you put it in the bulletin doesn't mean anybody read it. Sorry if there's any office managers in here, but I'm the worst. I never read the bulletin because I think I know what's going on because I work there. And so I never read the bulletin. And then they're like, well, it was in the bulletin. I'm like, I don't read it. I don't read the bulletin. And half the people don't pick up the bulletin. So it's not, you got to figure out m multiple ways. Um, I don't remember where this fact came from or where I read it. So it could be completely inaccurate, all of those caveats. But you have to communicate in seven ways, seven times. Seven times and in multiple different ways. OK, cool. So it's, it's true. I don't remember where I read it, but it's true. Uh, <laughs> if the marketing class said it, then it must be true. She said it takes about seven points of communication for somebody to actually receive it. Like, like receive it. so. She starts eight to six weeks out. Yes. Um, I think what you said about you having to make announcements is just as valuable when like, a pastor or a church leader comes to your Christmas program or whatever, and they're up there sharing their perspective of it or greeting people in a, in a way that people are like, oh, that's who is this person. But those connections are great. I think when you guys talked about how do you get your congregation on board, I think you can have a designated Sunday or a designated thing that you're like, hey, everybody's still a little different because we're inviting all these people in. It also allows your parents to know, hey, this is going to be a little different. Right. And then to piggyback that communication of how you communicate from the church side or from the school side to the church, I think it's also important like with this partnership and I like I say it all the time to my teachers. Um, most, of the, most of them have bought into this new paradigm, but we're still in change management. That's another one of my growth opportunities is change management of helping a teacher that has been teaching preschool for 35 years and doing it one way and going, but no, we want, we want to partner with our families. So we need, yes, this lesson that happens here, but what's the take home application? How are you applying what you're doing here in the classroom to what's happening at home? How are you, you bridging that? And they're like, I don't do that. I'm like, well, you work here, so you do. Um, <laughs> this is the paradigm. I know I'm like goofy and silly a lot of the time, but I'm still your boss. Um, <laughs> But how do you change management? This mindset of you've got uh, a church here and a school here. And that's where, too, like understanding the, the processes of making that change and how you. And again, I'll, I'll tell one of my horror stories really quick, and then I'll call on you. Um, I thought we had it down. I really thought my, like, my teachers had bought in. We were good, everything else. And from the spring of 22 to the fall of 22, we doubled in size. We went from 30 kids to 60 kids. And partnering with families is hard, and it's messy, and it takes more time. And my teachers went, nope. All, those old, all the new paradigms that I thought they had bought into and everything else, they came up to one crisis and went, nope, I'm going back to the old way. This is too hard. And so that's where, even from when I put in the, the 
application to, to talk about this. I was like, oh yeah, I got so many wins and I've got so many, yeah, I've got some really good stories here. And now I'm, then I'm like preparing the presentation from just that time. I'm like, oh no, we don't. No, we still have so many areas to find better ways. And, and also partnering with families means partnering with your teachers as a family unit as well. Um, and especially, I mean, the ones that are members of the church is great, but the ones that go to another church, it's, it's, it's more, in, you got to be more intentional about that. Um, the loving, the being there, those kind of things, that's the easy stuff. Um, but helping them see that they're part of that partnership too. That partnership relationship doesn't happen without your teachers and your aides because they have the most contact points. Um, yes, I try to be outside during big, the main pickup times, but we don't have, other than our half day, we don't have a window of pickup time. So from 3 o'clock to 5.30, we have families picking up. Um, and they just pick up whenever it's available. They're convenient for them up until 5.30. Um, sometimes 5.32. Uh, 5.35. Um, no, we're, off, we're right off the 101. So we're one of the busiest interstates, but it's not an interstate, but highway in America is the 101 in California. So we can't be strict about pickup times. We, we try, and we're like, please be respectful of my teacher's times, but at the same time, traffic is traffic in Southern California. So you just kind of have to love the families through that. Uh, yes. Um, FaceTime is important. Doing your own announcements, like during COVID, I did all the children's message videos, right? And that was that helped our older generation who don't have kids go, oh, all right, that like I understand where you're coming from. But I, I made a very valiant effort to learn every kid's name and their dog's name and everything else. And I only have so much time. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so, it's okay. It was a rough transition, but um, it took a long time to learn that I had to bring other people. Yeah. And you, like, I'm going to caution you all. You have to bring other people in. Yeah. You have to have a Miss Virginia who's going to be playing drums and she's going to be you, who can know some of those kids too. And then your core group is going to be feeding into and including those people. Well, and that's especially, you know, because when we had six kids in the preschool, like, it was really easy to partner with families. I had five families. I'm like, all right, five families, four staff. Here we go. Um, thank you, PPP loan. Um, but yeah, <laughs> but now that it's 60, it's 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 messier. It's harder. Um, but the interesting thing is, too, we have families that have been in our program. You know, I've been here almost at Christ the King almost four years, and so we've had families that were with us pre-COVID and, you know, as they trickle back that then are now telling their, their peers in the neighborhood are like, oh, you got to check out Christ the King. I'm like, well, I'm not really Christian. I'm not really interested in a Christian school. I'm like, no, no, no. You got to call Sarah. Call Sarah at Christ. I'm like, I, the first time they, a parent called and said, well, I was told I need to talk to Sarah and Sarah's going to help me out. And I almost, I got off the phone about bawling. I'm like, this is a parent that left two years ago and her neighbor was in a crisis and had emergency uh, custody of her grandchild. And she's like, I had a two year old. What am I going to do? I got to work full time. And that, I mean, and, and that's the, that's the Holy spirit. That's God. Like that's, it's not because of me. It's because of what God does through me, but to be able to be that, that trust and the fact that our school was known in our little bitty Newberry Park community as being the, the school for teachers that was closed a lot and that the director was always trying to like change the hours in the summer and you had to pick up early in the summer because she didn't want to work until as late. I'm not trying to bash her. She had her own paradigm. But we had a reputation of being that kind of school. And it took time to change that paradigm. And it's fun to now see that you talked about a garden. It's fun to see 
a couple years later through pruning and, and, and processing the, the fruit that has been bared because of that time. And so in some ways, I'm not grateful for COVID, <laughs> but it, you know, as a first year director, to have some of that time to really stop and step back and go what's valuable and what's not. What are we investing in that we need to invest more in? And what are things that, you know, it's okay to let go. Um, and no, that didn't happen from March 10th to April 30th when we, or March 20th to April 30th while we were closed. Um, but that the, I think we really had an opportunity. Um, yeah, COVID was hard, we all know that. But we also, some, there was growth stuff that happened in COVID too. And um, we really started talking about relationships. We started talking about, oh wait, there are people that are really hurting because they don't have any contact. And we can be a place for, of love and a place for support. Um, we kind of asked these questions. I was like, I think we already answered. Um, the final couple questions I had, what are you already doing just in your own head or you can share it with a group, but what are you already doing that you might be able to like turn the knob up a little? Um, I, I run the sound. I also do all the AV work for the church because, you know, that makes sense as a preschool director. It makes perfect sense as a DCE. It does not make sense as a preschool director. Um, but, you know, you turn a knob just a little bit and, and the focus changes and the, the sound changes. And so what are things that you can do that you can add to? Um, and where are some areas you can create processes to support families? Have a plan. Even if, like, I, when I was doing youth ministry, I was like, I have a plan, but I know that half of the plan is going to get thrown out the window half the time. But if you don't have the plan, it's going to be chaos. If you have a plan, you at least have the foundation to deviate from. I mean, detours are going to happen. When you're working with people, it's not just kids. When you work with people. Um, I volunteered this summer, this past summer, at the National Youth Gathering as an ambassador. And somebody made some comment, like, you're really calm in this chaos. And I was like, oh, I'm a preschool director. And like, oh, yeah, so all those kids. And I was like, oh, no, preschool teachers. Uh, <laughs> it's, the kids are easy. <laughs> No offense to any preschool teachers in the room. We love you. You're amazing. Um, but where, what are some areas in your personal ministries? Can you like take a step back and go, this might be a growth area. Let's think through as a staff of how we can better engage and equip um, our families. Uh, and then... Uh, we'll close in prayer. And then I have my contact information up here. If you want to chat... Um, I, I try to be as available as I can. Um, I'm really good at texting. I'm not so great at email. Um, I'm, I'm a Gen Xer, but sometimes I lean a little millennial when it comes to that. So, um, but I try to I get in trouble for not doing email. Uh, we, ha we use Brightwheel in our school. I know a lot of people use ProCare, um, Class Dojo, all those kind of things. Those kind of communication tools are great to keeping keep your parents engaged in what's happening. The more engaged they are, the more willing they're going to be to show up on that Sunday morning or show up on a, a Friday night for a 0.5K and they don't really understand what it is or why you're doing it. But they're like, yeah, that sounds like fun. Let's do it. Is there food? Yes, there's food. Come, we're Lutherans. Of course there's food. <laughs> can't do anything without food. Come on. At least got donuts or something. Um, but again, I don't show pictures of the church, show pictures of you. Uh, <laughs> hey, it's good though. We're focused on the cross. Um, but please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for all the amazing things you're doing um, in the ministries in this room and in the ministries throughout the world. God, we see your presence. We see you moving. Um, guide us in the way to go. We love you. Help us share your love with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming.